Okay, the new starter set for Dungeons & Dragons has started to ship in the United States, and it's called Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. Yesterday, I recorded a complete unboxing video, which showed what came in the box, which was uh, the adventure itself, a rule book, a set of dice, and character sheets. I also recorded a video doing a flip through of the entire adventure and a flip through of the entire rule book. So today I thought I would take an in-depth look at the different chapters starting with chapter one. So it goes without saying this is going to have tremendous spoilers in it. So if you're planning on uh, participating this, in this game as a player, then this isn't something you're going to want to look at. But for people who are interested in this and haven't been able to purchase it yet or it's just not even available in your part of the world then I thought you know you would appreciate being able to have a, uh, a detailed look at the adventure. I am not a professional YouTuber so the quality here isn't going to be the greatest and I will occasionally stumble over my words, mispronounce things and, uh, and whatnot so just forgive me for all of that. But let's go ahead and get started here. Okay chapter one, Dragon's Rest. The adventure begins at a tiny cloister called Dragon's Rest, a haven where world-weary people come to seek peace, reconciliation, and enlightenment. There, the characters learn about the dangers facing Stormwreck Isle. Each character has a specific reason for coming to the cloister, as shown on the character sheets. You can also let players invent their own reasons for their characters to seek out Runara's wisdom and assistance. So let's pause right there. Let's take a look at a couple of these character sheets. We won't necessarily go through all of them, but let's just see what the stated reasons are for the pre-generated characters uh, for having come to Dragon's Rest. Let's go ahead and start with the wizard. No reason other than that's the one that I had on top of the character stack. So we need to read the background and then the personal goal. Okay, so this text is a little small, but uh, I think I can still make it out okay. Okay, your parents identified your magical talent early in your long elven life and arranged for you to be apprenticed to a kindly wizard in the city of Neverwinter. You excelled at your studies and forged friendships and rivalries and other ap apprentices. You always had a particular knack for, wieldy, for wielding flashy energetic forces and you focused your study on the school of evocation. Your background shaped your character in some important ways. A secret sought by a colleague drives you. Your skills, your skill proficiencies in, you know, I lost my line. Your skill proficiencies in arcana and history also reflect your upbringing, studying the nature of magic and the great wizards of days past who wielded it. After graduating from your apprenticeship, you and your peers went your separate ways to focus on your own studies. Recently, you received a letter from one of your colleagues pointing you toward a source of lost knowledge. Shortly after the letter arrived, you learned tragic news. Your friend died under mysterious circumstances. All right, so that's the background. Now, your personal goal is to discover that lost knowledge. The letter spoke of an arcane observatory built on a nearby island by wizards long gone, and it hinted at powerful magic hidden there. A small cloister known as Dragon's Rest also resides on the island. The, ter the caretaker of the cloister's temple to the dragon god Bahamut, who is a patron of heroes and a champion of justice, must have information regarding the observatory. This elder Runara can set you on the path to discover the knowledge your friend never found. Okay, so the wizard is uh, has came to Dragon's Rest because they are seeking out this this uh, lost knowledge that was spoken of by their friend in the letter, and apparently the friend uh, has 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 died, and maybe they died actually coming to the island trying to figure out, you know, what that lost knowledge was. Okay, now we can take a look at the rogue. So we'll look over this section on the criminal background and then of course the personal goal. 
You fell in with a thieves' guild called the Gilded Gallows at an early age. The guild has prospered in recent years, and its, and its influence is spreading across the Sword Coast. You followed that expansion, hoping to find your fortune in the city of Neverwinter. Your background shaped your character in important ways. You learned the use of thieves' tools from scoundrels and gamblers, shown in proficiencies on the front of the sheet, and picked up the goblin language at the same time. Your skill proficiencies in deception and stealth also reflect your upbringing, talking your way out of trouble and skulking past unfriendly eyes. Fortunes in Neverwinter have been fair, but not the fast riches you hoped for. You heard a story from a smuggler about a high-ranking member of the Guild of Gallows who turned traitor, killed their partner, and fled with a sovereign's ransom and treasure. Thanks to details you've picked up here and there that corroborate the story, you've, uh, you're certain it's more than just a rumor. Personal goal, find the lost fortune. Whoever that gilder was who skipped out with the gold, they've covered their tracks well. The trail went cold and never winter, but recently you've learned of a remote island cloister called Dragon's Rest. The cloister holds a temple to the dragon god Bahamut, who is a patron of heroes and a champion of justice. There is also a community of hermits who live there now, the perfect place to hide for someone wishing to escape their past. If that treasure's there, you'll find it. Okay, so that's why the rogue is going to uh, Dragon's Rest. And so there's, uh, let's see, there's five sheets in total. Let's take a look at the Paladin. Okay, noble background. Your family is no stranger to wealth, power, and privilege. In the glory days of Neverwinter, your parents ruled the country of Corlin Hill, located in the hills northeast of the city. But Mount... Hote now erupted 30 years ago, devastating Neverwinter and erasing Cornell Hill. Instead of growing up on an estate, you were raised in a small townhouse in Waterdeep. As an adult, you stand to inherit only a title. Your background shaped your character. You learned the languages of dwarves and giants from childhood tutor shown on the languages on the front of the sheet. And your skill proficiencies in history and persuasion reflect your education in history and etiquette. Since swearing your oath to Bahamut, you've returned to Neverwinter and have been a champion to those who, over, who are overlooked by the institutions that exist to protect them. Recently, your resolve has been shaken by corruption in the city guard and ruling aristocrats. Personal goal, rejuvenating pilgrimage. Seeking to reinvigorate your resolve, you learned of a, remote, of a remote cloister, Dragon's Rest, on a tiny island. The cloister holds a temple to the dragon god Bahamut. You feel drawn to the temple. You, uh, you feel drawn to contemplate your place in the world there. And then they have some options for, like, making the character yours. Okay, so let's take a look. I guess we will go ahead and look at all five characters. I was only going to look at a couple of them, but we've already done three. There's only two left, so might as well look at all of them. So this is the fighter. Okay, so folk hero background. Your parents lived in the prosperous village of Thundertree, east of the city of Neverwinter and at the edge of the Neverwinter Wood. But when nearby Mount Hotnow erupted 30 years ago, your parents fled perhaps carrying you in your infancy, depending on how old you are. Your family drifted from village to village around the region, finding work as laborers where they could. Your background shaped your character in important ways. You learned the languages of several different peoples, shown in the languages section on the front of the sheet. Your skill proficiencies in animal handling and survival also reflect your upbringing, working with animals and getting by in the natural world. You spent the last few years in Neverwinter as a carpenter, working at the city's bustling docks. 
but it's clear to you and everyone around you that you are destined for much more. You stood up to an abusive ship captain once, so other dock workers look up to you. Someday, you'll come into your own. You'll be a hero. Personal goal, determine your destiny. In the remote cloister of Dragon's Rest lives an old sage who is supposed to possess great wisdom or possibly supernatural insight. The cloister holds a temple to the dragon god Bahamut, who is a patron of heroes and a champion of justice. Maybe Elder Runara can help you determine exactly what your heroic destiny is and set you on the right path to fulfill it so you can become the hero you know you're meant to be. All right, so that's the fighter. And last but not least would be the cleric. Okay, so the cleric has a soldier background. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to take a quick sip of water. So it says here, you trained as a soldier on the island of Mintarn and joined a mercenary company. You traveled to the city of Neverwinter with your company to serve in both the army and city watch. Over time, you grew disillusioned with many of your fellow soldiers. They seemed to enjoy they seem to enjoy their authority at the expense of peoples they're supposed to protect. Your background shaped your character in important ways. You learned several languages in the course of your military career shown on the front of the sheet. Your skill proficiencies your skill proficiencies in athletics and intimidation reflect your physical training and ability to overawe foes. Recently, you've had dreams of a shadow creeping across the sea like a shroud, swallowing an island in darkness. Though you dismissed the dream at first, you began to hear a voice calling you to stand against death's endless hunger. Certain of your, desti certain of your deity's wishes, you resigned your post and set out on your quest. Personal goal, banish a shadow of death. Researching images from your dreams pointed you to Stormwreck Isle, not far from Neverwinter. A remote cloister there holds a temple to the dragon god Bahamut, who is a patron of heroes and a champion of justice. Someone at the cloister may hold the key to the impending doom your deity wishes you to avert. Okay, so that gives us uh, a bit of a look at what it was that has drawn each of the five characters to to this part of uh, the Sword Coast. So now that we've understand why the characters are here, and again, I imagine each of them, you know, like it says, they can make up their own reason, but, you know, if they want to use the stated reasons on the character sheets, that's what we just went over. Okay, welcome to Dragon's Rest. And, you know, you're going to read the following text when you're ready to start. So assuming, you know, you're ready to start your adventure, all your players are settled down and listening to you, you would read, Your journey was uneventful, but the island, now visible off the bow, promise, promises rare wonders. Seaweed shimmers in countless brilliant colors below you, and rays of sunlight defy the overcast sky to illuminate the lush grass and dark basalt rock of the island. Avoiding the rocks jutting up from the ocean, your ship makes its way toward a calm harbor on the island's north side. A large open-air temple comes into view, perched on the edges of a cliff high above you. The ship drops anchor at the mouth of the harbor, and two sailors row you ashore. You have plenty of time to admire the towering statue at the center of the temple, depicting a wizened man surrounded by seven songbirds. A long path winds up the side of the cliff to the temple, dotted along the way with doorways cut into the rock. Sailors set you ashore on a rickety dock where a large rowboat is neatly tied. They point you to the base of the path and wish you good luck before they row back to the ship. Your visit to Dragon's Rest begins. Okay, so these sailors have rowed you over to the shore 
and bid you farewell, and then they headed off on their way. So this is the point where, you know, it's suggested that you uh, allow your characters to take that time to introduce themselves. It says here, before continuing with the adventure, encourage the players to introduce their characters to each other if they haven't done so already. They might want to discuss their reasons for dis visiting Dragon's Rest, or they might prefer to keep their reasons secret for now. If they have any questions about what they can see of the cloister from the boat, use map 2 on page 11 and the information in Dragon's Rest locations to answer them. Ask the players to give you the party's marching order as they start toward the, uh, as they start toward the cloister, who's in front and who's bringing up the rear. Make a note of this marching order. When you're ready, continue with the drowned sailor section. All right, so let's cross-reference here. So it says to, uh, it says if your players have any questions, you want to use the map number two on page 11. So let's take a look quickly at page 11. So that's going to be this map here. Yeah, map number two, page 11. And it says uh, to use the information in the Dragon's Rest locations to answer them. So let's identify that. Dragon's Rest locations. Which, okay, so that's here. Okay, so, th so this section here. Uh, if they have any questions, you're going to use this map. And you're going to use these keyed sections. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So once, uh, once everything is settled and everybody's ready to move on you're then going to move into the Drowned Sailors section. So we'll read the following text to start the encounter. As you're about to leave the beach and start your climb, you hear a ruckus of splashing and a wet, gurgling moan behind you. Three figures are shambling up from the water's edge, about 30 feet away. They're dressed as sailors, but their skin is gray, and they look drowned. Seawater drools from their slack mouths as they lurch toward you. Okay, so you kind of envision the environment here. Uh, I think we're basically at this point, you know, we've just been dropped off. We're ready to head our way up here. But as we're getting ready to go, there are these uh, three figures that are coming up out of the sea and heading towards the party. So sounds like we might have an encounter on our hands here. Let's keep reading. The three shambling sailors are zombies, the animated corpses of sailors who died in a recent shipwreck. The characters face a choice. They can turn and fight the zombies, or they can continue up the path and leave the slow shambling zombies behind. Okay, so it sounds like uh, the, there's no forced combat. There's no forced encounter here. They can just walk away. And since the zombies are slow, um, they can just basically outwalk them and it's not going to be an issue. So here is the zombie um, stat block. So let's read it. Zombies are mindless, reanimated corpses that have no memories from their past lives. So we got a zombie, medium undead, typically neutral evil. Armor class of 8, 22 hit points, or you can generate new hit points by rolling 3d8 plus 9. Speed of 20, and challenge rating of a, of a quarter, so your party should be able to pretty easily deal with these three zombies, I would think. Uh, the Undead Fortitude. If damage reduces the zombie to 0 hit points, the zombie makes a constitution saving throw with a DC of 5 plus the damage taken. So if they took six hit points, the DC would be 11. So they, they do this roll unless the damage is, is radiant or from a critical hit. So if the damage is radiant, they don't do the saving throw. If it's a critical hit, they don't do a saving throw. But otherwise, if they do the saving throw, then if they're successful, uh, the zombie drops to one hit point instead of zero. So so just dropping to zero like normal won't kill them. Uh, they, they would just keep droning along at one hit point. Uh, unusual nature, the zombie doesn't require air, food, drink, or sleep, and their actions are slam. It's a melee attack, plus three to hit with a reach of five feet, one target, 
uh, hit four or one d6 plus one bludgeoning damage. So you're facing three of those. So let's continue reading here. Uh, if the characters turn and fight, this is the first combat encounter in the adventure. Here are the steps you should follow to run it. Number one, review the, stop, the zombie stat block in Appendix B. So we got ahead of ourselves there. We've already done that. Use the initiative rules in the rule book to determine who acts first, second, third, and so on. Keep track of everyone's initiative on a notepad. So roll initiative. Number three, on the zombies initiative count, they move toward the characters. If they get close enough, they may they if they get close enough, they make melee attacks. The zombies stat block contains information you need to resolve these attacks. If all the characters are more than 20 feet away, the zombie uh, the zombies use the dash action so they can move farther. For more information on what zombies can do on their turn, see combat in the rulebook. Number four, the zombies fight until they're all defeated. All right, so here we have a tip, undead fortitude. The zombies undead fortitude trait reflects how hard it is to kill these walking corpses. When this trait prevents a zombie from dying, give the players a hint about what happened. You might say, that should have finished the creature off, but it refuses to stop moving. On the flip side, any time a zombie takes radiant damage, such as from the cleric's sacred flame cantrip, you might describe the creature as howling in agony. So yeah, you want to give your players a little bit of a clue without outright telling them what's going on so that they can, you know, be steered towards how to shut these things down. This can help the players realize that radiant damage is a way to get around undead fortitude. If the players ask whether their characters know anything about fighting zombies, have them make a DC-10 intelligence checks. Those who succeed might recall that a particular powerful blow, a critical hit, or radiant damage can help finish off a zombie. So if your players are uh, aware enough to say, do I know anything about zombies, have them roll a, a 20-sided dice if they get a 10 or higher, then you can choose to say, oh, you know, hey, you're a cleric, and somewhere in your studies, you know, you've heard that zombies are particularly weak against, uh, you know, radiant damage. And maybe the fighter classes or, um, you know, physical attack classes, you know, you might let them know that they have heard that a powerful blow can, can shut down a zombie. Okay, so... Uh, Runara's aid. In the unlikely event that the zombies defeat the adventurers, Runara comes to their rescue. So if all your characters get um, knocked out, then you would say, you know, the characters wake up in the temple, um, which would be Area 5 of the Dragon's Rest, and Runara will explain that she heard the sounds of combat and arrived just in time to prevent the zombies from dragging the characters into the sea. So you have a bit of an out here, and just in case, you know, if, I guess maybe if you're only playing with one or two players, then there's a possibility they could both go down. Um, and, and if that happens, then you have this out to say, um, the last thing you saw was blackness and you fell over, and then you wake up in this temple, something like that. And then we have avoiding the zombies. If the characters decide not to fight the zombies, they easily escape from the slow, shambling monsters. Yeah, so they can just outwalk them. They don't have to run or anything. They can just go on their way, and it's no, it's no issue. They're not going to pursue them, it sounds like. The zombies don't follow them up the path toward Dragon's Rest. The characters will have another opportunity to deal with the zombies later. See Cloister Quests later in the chapter. Okay, so that's good. So if they do end up... Uh, eschewing the zombies, they can come back later. All right, so that's our first, uh, like, encounter that we could have possibly dealt with. So now we'll move on to meeting the inhabitants. Read this text when the characters first climb the path to Dragon's Rest. 
So as the characters, you know, get past this part, either they kill the zombies or just keep walking. I guess once you get up towards this area, maybe, then um, that's where this part takes place. Your arrival quickly draws the attention of the entire population of the place, which consists mostly of kobolds. These small reptilian folk eye you curiously while a couple of humans watch from a distance. All the cloister's residents are dressed in simple clothes, and no one carries a visible weapon. One of the kobolds pipes up with, What's your name? At that, all the kobolds begin barraging you with questions. Where are you from? What's that? Why are you here? And more that are lost in the den. So you get this imagery that, you know, you're kind of getting surrounded by kobolds and they're just pounding you questions, questions, questions. Visitors to the cloister are rare and the kobolds' curiosity is insatiable. They keep asking you questions until the characters insist they stop. <laughs> so yeah, the, the kobolds are just going to keep pounding you with questions so as the DM, you just kind of have to basically almost annoy your players until they're like, stop, stop. Let me take a sip of water. When the characters quiet the kobolds, or if the players start showing signs of exasperation, the leader of the cloister approaches to welcome the characters. Read the following text. The chattering kobolds fall silent as a new figure comes into view, descending gracefully from the upper part of the cloister. She's an elderly human woman with weathered brown skin, white hair and tight braids, and kindly hazel eyes, dressed in a simple white robe. She smiles as she draws near and extends her arms in greeting. Welcome to Dragon's Rest, she says. May Bahamut's guidance lead you to whatever you seek. This is Elder Runara, the leader of the Dragon's Rest. If the characters defeated the zombies at the beach, she thanks them for their service to the cloister. Even if they did not fight the zombie, she tells them they're welcome to stay at Dragon's Rest as long as they wish, sleeping either in one of the monastic cells, Area A1, or in the temple, Area A5, and eating with the rest of the community in the dining room, Area A3. Runara says nothing about payment of any kind. If the characters offer to give money, if the characters offer to give money or perform services around the cloister in exchange for her hospi hospitality, she accepts these gifts. Throughout this adventure, Dragon's Rest serves as a home base for the characters. All the places they'll explore on the island are within a few miles of the cloister, and they can return here whenever they wish to rest heal, and get information they need for the next part of their adventures. So that's pretty similar to Dragon of Ice by her peak, how you would keep going back to Phandalin um, after, you know, doing the quests that the that the town master would, would give you, or that he'd have posted on the job board. In addition, they can buy any of the equipment described on the rulebook from Myla C. Kobolds, so that's going to be somebody over here. During their time at Dragon's Rest, the characters can interact with any of its residents. All the residents but Renara live in the small monastic cells cut into the cliffs, cliff face, area A1 of the cloister map. Okay, so then we move on to the information about the Elder Renara. Elder Renara is the leader of Dragon's Rest. She appears as a human woman, but she is actually an adult bronze dragon disguised in human form. She guides the residents of the cloister in their contemplation and study. The cloister's inhabitants know Runara's true identity, but they do not speak of it to the visitors. Runara's initial attitude toward the characters is indifferent. See the social interaction section of the rulebook. She becomes friendly as soon as the characters demonstrate that they care about the cloister's safety, such as fighting the zombies at the beach or undertaking any of the quests she offers them. See Cloister's Quest later in the chapter. If characters harm any of the residents of Dragon's Rest, she becomes hostile and insists the characters make amends for the harm they did before she is willing to deal with them in any way. 
So to gain Renara's favor right away, it would actually benefit your players if they did deal with those zombies. But again, if they don't, she's still kind to them. And will her demeanor will change if they accept uh, one of the missions, basically. Renara's mission is to help those whose lives have been shaped by violence find new paths forward in peace. Ultimately, she would like to see chromatic and metallic dragons find a peaceful way to coexist in the world. In the meantime, she finds comfort in helping humans and other people escape from cycles of violence. Runara maintains a secret lair in a cave accessed by an undersea tunnel, a short distance from the cloister and not shown on the map of Dragon's Quest. She is careful not to enter or leave the cave when anyone might spot her, and she enters and emerges from the water in the open ocean, out of sight of the cloister. The other residents of the cloister think she lives in the temple at the top of the island, Area A5, or they simply laugh away queries, or they simply laugh away queries about her accommodations, explaining that she's always in the temple or in the library, or checking on the rest of the residents. She never seems to sleep. All right, so that's about Renara. Let's talk about the kobolds. Kobolds are small reptilian humanoids who believe they are descended from dragons and gravitate to the service of dragons. Over the centuries, many bands of kobolds have been drawn to Stormwreck Isle by the lingering draconic magic that suffuses the island. Nine kobolds utterly devoted to Renara now live at Dragon's Rest. The kobolds of Dragon's Rest are lawful good, sharing Renara's ideals of justice and compassion. Since they are sensitive to sunlight, they work at night and avoid moving about during the day. Unless otherwise noted, the kobolds are initially friendly toward the adventurers. The kobolds are summarized below. They can provide comic relief, offer a down-to-earth perspective, or be a way for you to pass hints to the players if they're having trouble putting things together. But don't feel like you need to bring all nine of these kobolds to life. Pick one or two of these kobolds that you and the characters like the most, and let them be the focus of the characters' interactions with the kobolds. That makes sense. Having nine NPCs is a bit much. Um, I should say nine kobold NPCs plus Runara plus whoever else we'll run into. So we can read about the different kobolds. So there's Aga. Aga speaks little and has no patience for sense. Uh, has no patience for nonsense. She keeps the rest of the kobolds organized and in line. She is indifferent toward the visitors, but if the characters show respect for the cloister and help her and help keep the more rambunctious kobolds in line, her attitude improves to friendly. Then we have Blep. Blep has a sharp danger sense and is convinced he's supernaturally lucky. His prized possession is an ordinary dagger he claims is magical. Frub has limitless energy and desperately needs help finding productive directions to channel it. He loves to ask questions about every about everything other people are doing. Let's see, we have a little bit of caption text up here. Ever since an unfortunate incident in the kitchen, Laylee is no longer allowed to handle Myla's alchemile fire. Okay, so now we have Kilnip. Kilnip has terrible insomnia and sleeps only a few hours each day. She is always tired, but an eager conversationalist. Then we have Laylee. Laylee has a curious mind and a talent for tools and building. She serves as Myla's helper. Mumpo is so audaciously courageous that he stole a copper piece from Renara's hoard. He's convinced she has no idea. He is wrong, but Renara finds the situation amusing and lets Mumpo continue to believe in her ignorance. Myla, lawful good cobalt tinker, is a winged kobold whose brothers Mech and Min now follow Sparkrender, the blue wormling in Clifftop Observatory, see chapter 4. When Myla's wings were 
badly injured in an attack by Sturges, which she describes as hungry, icky, blood-sucking bat things. Renara helped in her recovery. Now Myla spends her time experimenting with alchemy, engineering, and magic. Rix is pious and tends to the temple, acting as Renara's assistant. She adores puns. Rix recently witnessed a ship crashing on the rocks to the north. See Cloister's Quest later in the chapter. Zark is rude and fond of colorful insults. His favorite words are, Eat my sword, bugbear breath, and your father was a gas spore. He is indifferent toward the visitors. All right, so that is our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's our nine kobolds. All right, so now we have Tarek. Tarek, let's go with Tarek. Tarek is a human man in late middle age. He has pale skin, tan, darker, with many freckles, auburn hair, and a beard that is mostly gray, and gray-blue eyes. Faded tattoos in an abstract design peek up the side of his neck from beneath his dirt-stained robes. An avid botanist, Tarek tends the cloister's garden plots, growing flowers, herbs, and vegetables. He is soft-spoken and helpful, eager to share his knowledge of herbalism. But his kind demeanor bellies his, uh, bellies his past as a ruthless poisoner for. But his kindly demeanor believes his past as a ruthless poisoner for a thieves' guild. After his work led to the death of his lover, he fled the guild and plans to spend the rest of his life atoning for his past evils. Tarek is initially is initially friendly toward visitors, but if a character pries into his past, his attitude shifts first to indifferent, then to hostile if the characters continue to push. When he's hostile, his demeanor becomes cold and clipped, and he avoids the characters if he can. A gold hangman's noose is worked into the design of Tarek's visible tattoos. A character who studies the tattoos and succeeds on a DC-15 intelligence history check recognizes the mark as a symbol associated with the Gilded Gallows, a thieves' guild that operates in a country far to the south called Eltigard. A character with the criminal background automatically succeeds on this check. Tarek does not willingly discuss the details of his past with anyone but trusted friends. Tarek frequently visits the sea caves on the south side of the island to acquire heart cap mushrooms from the myconids that live there. He uses the mushrooms to make potions of healing, but the myconids have installed a fearsome guardian at their caves, a fungus-covered octopus monster that has turned him away on his latest visits, and he is worried. See Cloister Quest. So it sounds like that's the setup to uh, one, of our, one of our quests. Take a sip of water here. Okay, we have Varnoth. Varnoth is a human woman whose frame, once tightly muscled, has thinned with age. Her black hair is cropped close to her scalp, and her light brown skin bears many scars, one of which runs across her left eye, which is milky and blind. An elegant prosthetic made from wooden metal replaces her right leg below the knee. Varnoth was a feared general at the head of a mercenary company called the Azure Wolves. Age and battle have taken a toll on her, and she is spending her twilight years in reflective contemplation at Dragon's Rest. Her demeanor is gruff, but she is observant and empathetic. Above all, Varnath, Bar Varnath believes in second chances and redemption. Varnath has a set of mason's tools that she uses to maintain the temple and other areas of the cloister. While working in the temple recently, she witnessed a ship change course and crash into the rocks to the north, see Cloister's Quest. Varnath is indifferent to the visitors, but a character can shift her attitude to friendly 
by engaging her in conversation on her favorite topics, history, ethics, and the impact of individual actions in the world. A character who learns Varnath's name and succeeds on a DC-15 intelligence history check recalls hearing of General Varnath Winder and the Azure Wolves, which was a mighty force in the East about a decade ago. A character with the soldier background succeeds on this check automatically. All right, so now we'll look at the the Dragon's Rest locations, which are, you know, all all the locations on the map over here. So the following locations are keyed to map two, which shows the layout of Dragon's Rest. A1, Path and Monastic Cells. So that's this area here that we're looking at. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six cells. So we're just concentrating on this section right now. So A1, uh, path and monastic cells, uh, monastic cells. So when they enter into that area, then we would read this text. A long path leads from the rocky shore up the side of the cliff with occasional stairs to ease the ascent. Here and there along the path, along the lower part of the path, well-tended garden plot hold flowers, herbs, and vegetables. About 30 feet above the bay, the path widens into a long plaza. Halfway along the plaza, a stone statue of a dragon gazes serenely down the path. Six open doorways are cut into the cliffside. So about the statue. The star in a circle symbol on the map represents the dragon statue. So that's this star right here. A character who examines the statue and succeeds on a DC-10 intelligence arcana check recognizes that it depicts a bronze dragon, a member of the metallic family. If characters ask Runara about the statue, she tells them it depicts Astalagan. Hmm, how do we want to go with that pronunciation? Astalagan. Let's go with Astalagan. She tells them that it depicts Astalagan, who died on these cliffs centuries ago. She doesn't tell them that Astalagan was her father. The Cells. The doorways lead into simple monastic cells occupied by the cloister residents. Each cell is furnished with a bed, a nightstand, a small desk, and a chair. The westernmost cell is vacant, and it is available to the characters if they don't mind sharing the space. Next to it is Tarek's cell, when Var then Varnoth's. The fourth cell is Myla's, cluttered with junk and tools. The fifth and sixth cells are strung with hammocks, offering space for the other eight kobolds to sleep. Okay, so this cell is available for the characters if they like. This cell is Tar Tarek's cell. This one is Varnoth's cell. This cell, the fourth one, is Myla's cell, clustered with tools and stuff. And then the last two cells are shared by the kobolds, the other eight kobolds. So that's what we have going on there. A2 is the winch house, which is uh, up here. So if they wind their way up the path up here, you would read this. A small freestanding building halfway up the path has, peaked, has a peaked roof and a weathered wooden door. A sturdy wooden pallet wrapped with rope hangs beneath the building on an iron chain lying flat against the face cliff. Inside the building is a winch that allows, and we don't read this, this is just DM information. Inside the building is a winch that allows the pallet to be lowered down to the water, 50 feet below. When boats deliver supplies to the cloister, the residents use this pallet to haul goods both up and down. A lever locks the winch in place. If a character pulls the lever, the pallet falls down to the water and floats there. As an action, a character can operate the winch to pull the pallet back up 10 feet. So over here there's a, a rope and winch system that lowers a pallet down to the water so that they can more easily bring supplies up. All right, take a sip of water. All right, section A3, 
which is over here. So when they wander around the path and enter into this area, you would read, A doorway in the rock opens into a dining room with a long table. Two benches run the length of the table, and a single chair sits at the table's head. A short hallway connects to a small, tidy kitchen. And then DM information that you can share with them, you know, upon investigation and questioning. The Cloister residents share three meals daily here. They take turns cooking, cleaning. They take turns cooking and cleaning up after meals. Nobody says it out loud, but the days when Tarek cooks are everyone's favorite. Well, why wouldn't they tell it out loud? So section A4 we'll do next. Uh, so if they wander into this section, you would read, of all the doorways cut into the cliff face, only one has an actual door. This entry's door is made of a sturdy oak with iron bands, and it swings open easily to reveal a spacious library. Bookshelves line every wall with three freestanding shelves in the west half of the room. In the east half is a table with two benches, writing implements, book stands, and glass shielded lamps. And then here we have our DM information again, uh, some of which is often available to the player if they ask questions or do investigations. Uh, the Cloister Library holds books and scrolls covering a variety of topics, but focused on theology and history. Runara spends nearly half her time in here studying, copying, and annotating the library's collection. Tarek and Varnoth also come here to read and discuss various works. Many of the kobolds visit as well, but mostly for the quiet. Only Myla could be described as studious. Okay, so then we have uh, section A5, so if they continue to wander around and work their way over here, we would have the Temple of Bahamut, and we would read, The highest point of the cloister is crowned by an open air temple that overhangs the cliff, supported by arched, arched stone struts anchored to the cliff face. The north wall of the temple is carved directly into the rock, while the rest is open to the sea air. Heavy pillars mark three open sides, supporting the wooden roof. In the center of the temple stands a stone statue of a kind-looking old man with canaries perched on his hands, shoulders, and head. A feeling of serenity suffuses the place. And then again, here's our DM information available to the players, some of which is available to the players if they start asking questions or examining, or if you just need to give them hints. Uh, the temple is very simple, with the statue represented by the star in a circle symbol on the map as its only furnishing. The statue depicts Bahamut, the platinum dragon, in mortal disguise surrounded by seven canaries that represent gold dragons who accompany him on his travels. A character who examines the statue and succeeds on a DC-10 intelligence religion check recognizes Bahamut and any resident of Dragon's Rest identifies the god if asked. Depressions in the statue's pedestal at the four cardinal directions hold offerings of incense made to Bahamut. Runara spends about half her time here, tending and maintaining the temple, offering prayers and incense, or in quiet contemplation. Other residents of the cloister help her, most often Varnoth and the Cobalt Ricks. The feeling of serenity that pervades the temple is the result of protecting magic, protective magic. A non-evil creative, uh, excuse me, a non-evil creature who makes a saving throw within the temple can roll a d4 and the number rolled to the saving throw and add the number rolled to the saving throw. If a character casts de detect magic in the temple, the spell reveals a faint aura around the statue. Runara is the only inhabitant of Dragon's Rest who knows that this is a lingering effect of the death of a dragon on this site. Her father, Astalagan. About Bahamut. Known as the Platinum Dragon, Bahamut is the patron and progenitor of metallic dragons. 
adventurers and dragons alike pray to Bahamut to uphold honor and justice, or when they need courage to face a great threat. He seldom interferes in the affairs of mortal creatures, though he makes exceptions to help thwart the machinations of Tiamat, the Dragon Queen, and the evil dragons that serve her. Okay, Cloister Quests. So, I assume that, you know, they spend their time in Dragon's, uh, dragon's Rest, and while they're there, they learn information, and what, some of the information they can learn probably is going to send them on these different quests. As the characters explore Dragon's Rest, the residents talk with them about the problems the cloister is facing. These conversations are opportunities for you to introduce the players to the adventures that await them in the sea caves, the shipwreck, and the ancient observatory. This adventure is designed to be flexible and give the players the sense that they're in charge of their destiny on Stormwreck Isle. Ideally, the characters will spend time at Dragon's Rest and then explore both Sea Growl Caves, described in Chapter 2, and the Wreck of Compass Rose, Chapter 3. They can choose where to go first. After they've explored both of those sites, they should be ready to face Sparkrender in the Clifftop Observatory, Chapter 4. Each character sheet includes a personal goal for that character. Some of these goals are concrete. The wizard, for example, is eager to learn the secrets of Clifftop Observatory. Others are more general and might be fulfilled gradually over the course of the adventure. Both the paladin and the fighter gaining a better understanding of their role in the world, for example. Use these goals described under individual quests below to help the players bring their characters to life as they interact with Runara and the other residents of Dragon's Rest. Zombie Resurgence Okay, so I guess uh, that ties back to what we were talking about when they first arrived on the island. Let me see if I can find that section over here, the Drowned Sailors, because it did say they could run away from the zombies, not really run, but just outwalk them, basically. And then it said that uh, if the characters decide not to fight, they easily escape, um, and so on. And it says that the characters will have another opportunity to deal with the zombies later, and so here we are with the zombie resurgence. So this is undoubtedly that second chance they have to deal with the zombies. So if the adventurers did not fight the zombies when they first arrived on the island, the zombies caused trouble later. After the characters have spent some time at the cloister, they hear cries for help. Read the following text. So I get the picture like, you know, if, you're, if your players are... You know, if they didn't deal with the zombies earlier and, you know, once they've made it to Dragon's Rest and they've spent some time there, if you hit like a lull period where things are slowing down, you could you could introduce this as something they could do. And honestly, I would say you could even introduce, introduce this as something they could do even if they did deal with the zombies because there could always be more. So you could read, uh, two residents of Dragon's Rest are running for their lives up the lower path. Their fishing equipment discarded behind them. Blood and dirt stain their robes. Three figures shamble after them. Bloated corpses dressed as sailors, moaning and gurgling. Roll initiative. <laughs> the characters have another opportunity to fight the three zombies, this time with the lives of two new acquaintances, Blep the kobold and Tarek the human gardener, hanging in the balance. See drowned sailors for help getting the encounter started. So again, you'd go back to the previous page for that. Blep has two hit points left after a zombie hit him, and he is convinced that his good luck and his magical dagger saved him from certain death. Tarek is unarmed, and the zombies overpowered both him and Blep if the characters don't help. So if you don't step in and do something, they're dead. If the characters talk to Renara about the zombies, she tells them, she suspects a wrecked ship off the rocks to the north is the source of these monsters, and she asks the characters to investigate the site. More zombies. 
If the characters defeated the zombies when they first arrived on the island, you can use this encounter. Okay, so I, I think I'm getting ahead of myself because <laughs> I was just saying that earlier. Um, if the characters defeated the zombies when they first arrived on the island, you can use this encounter at any point during the adventure to add a little extra combat spice to the characters' lives. If the characters have already reached level 2, you can use from 4 to 6 zombies to give them a good challenge. Sounds interesting. I'd, be, I'd enjoy playing this game. Uh, sea Caves. Tarek is eager to reestablish contact with the Myconids of the Sea Caves. He asks the characters to visit the caves, find out what's wrong with the Myconids, and bring him back some heart cap mushrooms. He warns them about the fungal octopus the Myconids have created as a guardian and tells them they'll probably have to fight the creature to gain access to the caves. He also gives them a foul-smelling sack of food scraps they can give the Myconids as a gesture of friendship. Finally, he gives them two potions of healing described in Appendix A. So, yeah, earlier uh, when we were reading about Tarek, it was described that he liked to go to the caves for to make healing potions, but his access to the cave has recently been cut off. So here, Tarek frequently visits the sea caves on the south side of the island to acquire heart cap mushrooms from the myconids that live there. He uses the mushrooms to make potions of healing, but the myconids have installed a fearsome guardian at the caves, a fungus-covered octopus monster that has turned away his latest visits, and he's worried. <coughs> so this section here is um, is essentially helping Tarek, and potentially yourselves as well, because it sounds like he can make you some potions of healing. Okay, shipwreck. Several ships have recently crashed on the rocks. Uh, let me start over. Several ships have recently crashed on the rocks north of Dragon's Rest and sunk with no survivors. And a few days ago, both Varnoth and the Cobalt Ricks witnessed the most recent wreck. They saw the ship abruptly veer off course and crash into the rocks. And they suggest the characters might help the island by discovering what caused the crash. If the characters ask Runara about it, she suggests that the answer is likely to be found on an older wreck, the wreck of Compass Rose. So that would introduce, I think that's a whole chapter. Yeah, I think that's chapter three. Individual quests. As described on the character sheets, the characters have their own reasons for visiting Dragon's Rest. The cleric. The cleric was led here by, recurring, by a recurring dream involving the shadow of death. If the character talks to Renara about the dream or their quest, Renara listens closely, then pauses to think, Well, she says, I am no expert on interpreting dreams, but perhaps the zombies you fought are the hunger of death you spoke of. She points the character toward the wreck of the compass rose, see shipwreck above, to investigate further. The fighter. The fighter has come to Dragon's Rest in the hope that Runara can help the character understand the sense of destiny that weighs on their shoulders. If the characters talk to Renara about this on first arriving at the cloister, Renara invites the characters to consider their reaction to the zombies on the how their reactions to the zombies on the beach might reflect their destiny or not. If the characters talk to Renara after having completed one or more of the adventurer's quests, she encourages the characters to consider whether their heroic actions might be the first manifestations of that destiny taking shape. At the end of the adventure, Runara encourages the character to continue on their path. If your destiny is not clear, if your destiny is not clear to you yet, I'm confident it soon will be. The Paladin Disillusioned with corruption, Disillusioned with the corruption of Neverwinter, the paladin comes to Dragon's Rest seeking rest and new resolve. Runara welcomes the character and encourages them to talk to Tarek and Varnoth, who both know about escaping lives of corruption and violence. She also encourages the paladin to spend time in the Temple of Bahamut. 
At the end of the adventure, she asks the paladin if they have learned anything about how to live in a world plagued with such corruption. If the character has no answer, she suggests, perhaps your adventures here have shown you a way to combat evil on your own terms. Perhaps others, perhaps other such adventures await you. The Rogue. The Rogue comes to Dragon's Quest in search of a lost fortune, supposedly secreted away on the island by a member of the Gilded Gallows. The Thieves Guild, the Thieves Guild member in question is Tarek, who did in fact betray the Guild, though the story has been twisted in the retelling. Tarek's last assignment for the Guild was to assassinate a traitor who was his lover. The two tried to flee Eldegard together, but his lover was killed by another assassin. Tarek escaped, but no treasure was involved. If the rogue asks about him, if the rogue if the rogue asks him about it, he explains he has left the life of crime and suggests perhaps it's time for the rogue to do the same. Let's read this down here. Runara saves the day. Runara is a powerful dragon, but she is dedicated to the cause of peace. She's not interested in fighting the battles that the characters might get themselves into, but she keeps an eye on them and she can rescue them if things go badly for them on the island. If any encounter on the island ends with all the characters unconscious, you can have the characters awaken in the temple, Area A5, with some of the kobolds tending to their wounds. Renara prefers not to explain how she rescued the characters. If this happens more than once, the characters might need extra assistance. If you haven't already, consider asking one or more players to play an additional character as a sidekick. You can explain that these additional characters have just arrived at Dragon's Rest and are eager to help. So it sounds like they're pretty interested in, you know, having you succeed in this adventure. So uh, if, if all your characters, you know, go to zero HP, uh, typically there's no way for any of them to recover and it's a TPK, a total party kill. But you can use this as an out if you want, or you can just say you're all dead and you gotta uh, create all new characters and start over. <laughs> all right, so let's move on to now. Moving on now to the wizard. The wizard carries a letter from a colleague about lost knowledge held in the Clifftop Observatory. See chapter four. If asked about the observatory, Runara says, "Many have sought the knowledge contained in that place." I can direct you there, but first, you need to show me you are worthy. She promises to direct the wizard to the observatory after the characters help deal with the other problems on the island. Lost Wormling When the characters have proven themselves trustworthy and competent by dealing with the, z by dealing with the zombies, the myconids, and the shipwreck, Renara decides it's time to confide in them. She summons them to the temple, Area A5. Read the following text when the characters arrive. Okay, so once the quests have been dealt with, you're, she, you're going to summon the players to the temple, and Renar is going to have a conversation with them. Elder, Elder Runara smiles as you approach. I have some things to show you, she says. There's a flash like a silent stroke of lightning, and the human woman is gone. In her place is an enormous dragon with bronze-colored scales. Now you see me as I truly am, she says, tilting her head with an expression that might be a smile on her scaled face. As you have discovered, this island has many old wounds, and I'm afraid the cycle of violence is starting again. I have one more favor to ask you. Runara outlines the history summarized in the adventure background. Uh, let me start over on that. Runara outlines the history summarized in the adventure background section and explains that each site the characters visited is linked to the death of a dragon. Then she tells them that a bronze wormling named Adron came to the island a few months ago and studied with her at Dragon's Rest. Five days before the character's arrival, 
he argued with her, angrily rejected her teaching of peace, and stormed away from the cloister. She fears he went to the ancient observatory on the southeast side of the island, which is another dragon's final resting place. She suspects some evil has arisen there, but says she dares not go there herself, lest her presence reopen old wounds. She gives them a moonstone key, a three-inch long, one-inch wide hexagonal prism made from moonstone, made from moonstone, with a dragon's head engraved on one end, and explains that they'll need it to access the observatory. Exploring the Island This adventure presents Dragon's Rest and three adventure locations in detail, but Stormwreck Isle holds the possibility of excitement and danger beyond those sites. While the characters travel between locations on the island, or if they set out to explore the island, they might stumble across fantastical creatures and locations that provide an extra challenge on their journeys. Additional Encounters Place these encounters wherever you want on the island, or use them as inspiration as you begin to craft your own adventures. Hot Springs Havoc This encounter poses a simple challenge for characters second level or higher, or a harder challenge for first level characters. It's particularly appropriate if the characters are rowing around the island or making their way along the coast at sea level. So if they're in that situation, you would read this block text. Billowing clouds of steam emerge from the rocks ahead, and the air grows thicker with moisture. As you round a bend, you see a cove where a hot spring burbles up from the rocks and spills into a pool before draining into the ocean. The turquoise water is luminescent, and the gray basalt edges of the spring are lined with vibrantly colored mushrooms, which occasionally burst in a shadow in a shower of rainbow spores. Not immediately visible to the characters are the guardians of the spring, the three fume drakes. Let's take a quick look at fume drakes. Let's see here. So here are, here's the information about fume drakes. Fume drakes are mischievous creatures that arise from the lingering magical energy of a dead dragon. They resemble small, legless dragons formed from clouds of greenish smoke. They delight in causing pain and confusion in other creatures. So the challenge rating is a quarter. Armor class of 12, 22 hit points, or 5d6 plus 5 if you roll your own. Uh, speed of 30, they fly. Uh, damage immunities, fire and poison. Condition immunities, poisoned. Dark vision out to 60 feet, passive perception of 10. Uh, they have a death burst. When the fume drake dies, it explodes in a cloud of noxious fumes. Each creature within 5 feet of the fume drake must succeed on a DC 11 constitution saving throw or take 4 poison damage or 1d8. Unusual nature. The fume drake does not require food, drink, or sleep. And it has a bite action, which is a melee weapon attack, plus four to hit, reach a five, one target. Upon a hit, it does four damage, four fire damage, or 1d4 plus two. And it has a scalding breath with a recharge six. The fume drake exhausts a 15-foot cone of scalding steam. Each creature in that area must make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw, taking four or 1d8 fire damage on a failed save, and half as much on a success. So that's just a bit of information about that particular creature. These mischievous creatures are initially indifferent to the characters and ignore their arrival, but if anyone attempts to gather mushrooms or enter the water of the hot springs, the fume drakes become hostile, emerging from the water to attack the group. Everybody, roll initiative. A character who examines the water and succeeds on a DC 10 wisdom perception check spots the shimmering outlines of the fume drakes in the water. In spring waters. The spring is the site of a brass dragon's death, and life-giving magic persists at the site. 
A character who spends 10 minutes bathing in the waters of the spring can roll one of their hit dice noted on each of the character sheets and regain uh, hit points equal to the roll plus their constitution modifier. Okay, so it's like the, uh, the Legend of Zelda Pond. A character can benefit from bathing in the hot spring at most once per day. Treasure. A character who examines the mushroom, mushrooms lining the spring and succeeds on a DC-15 intelligence nature check identifies these mushrooms as wind spores, a rare fungus with a unique magical property. When a creature squeezes a wind, a wind spore, let me restart. When a creature squeezes a wind spore mushroom's cap, it releases a small cloud of spores. For one hour, the creature doesn't need to breathe as the spores provide it with oxygen. That's cool. A wind spore is worth 30 gold pieces, and at any given time, 2d4 wind spores are ready to be harvested. There, there, I'll bear. This encounter poses a medium challenge for third level characters and a difficult challenge for second level characters. Use it if your group enjoys combat or the players need a chance to practice using their character's new abilities after gaining a level. It's particularly appropriate if the characters are traveling across the island rather than following the coast. So if they're traveling through the island, uh, you could insert this as an as a combat opportunity and you would read a discordant sound half a low growl half a piercing screech rips through the air abruptly a hulking creature comes into view a mix of purple feathers and deep brown fur covers its bear-like body and its large eyes stare hungrily at you from its owlish head so this is an owl bear. So let's take a look at the owl bear. So here we are. This is the little artwork for the owl bear. Although the owl, the artwork on this page is much cooler. <laughs> Looks like a much more intimidating creature right here. The owlbear's ferocity and stubbornness make it a terrifying predator. It fears few other creatures. Scholars debate whether it is a na natural creature or the result of a magical experiment. So right away I see the challenge rating of this was three. So this would be a quite a difficult challenge, I would think, and perhaps even deadly um, unless you have a full party. So armor class of 13, 59 hit points, or roll 7d10 plus 2 to calculate your own hit points. Speed of 40, and you can see, you know, its strength and all its attributes there. Perception of 3, uh, dark vision out to 60 feet, passive perception of 13. Keen sight and smell. The owlbear has advantage on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight or smell. And here we go with the actions. Multi-attack. The owlbear makes one beak attack and one claw attack. So for its beak attack, it's a melee weapon attack, plus 7 to hit, reach of 5, and it attacks one creature. Upon a hit, it does 10 piercing damage, or roll it yourself using 1d10 plus 5. Its claw attack is a melee weapon attack, plus 7 to hit, so the same. Reach of 5, the same, does one target, same. Upon a hit, it does 14 slashing damage, so a bit more brutal, or roll 2d8 plus 5 to calculate your own damage. So yeah, I think that would be that would be a very deadly attack. I mean, 10 and 14 are the average hits and you're dealing with, you know, characters who have um you know, they're starting out with you know, what do we have here? 8 hit points, so that's a one shot. 9 hit points, that's a one shot. 12 hit points, yeah. One one hit and they're they're down. 12. 11, yeah. So if your characters aren't leveled up quite a bit, uh, well, not quite a bit, but if they aren't leveled up to 2 or uh, 3, then that owlbear encounter is going to be deadly. But I guess, I guess if I'm understanding this bit correctly, 
um, instead of just having them die, you can have Renara save the day. If any encounter on the island ends with all characters, yeah, so that, so, so, you know, if they, if they encounter the owlbear and you get essentially a TPK, a total party kill, you could have, do a bit of hand waving and say, you know, you're not really dead, Renara saved you somehow. This owlbear is hostile toward the characters. It views them as intruders in its territory, though its goal is to drive them away rather than kill them. Originally a party of a performing trope, the owlbear was stranded here after the ship carrying the trope crashed on the northern rocks. Any character within five feet of the owlbear notices a small wooden whistle hanging around its neck. This whistle was, and still can be, used to train and command the owlbear. Interesting. A character within five feet of the owlbear can use their action to attempt to grab the whistle. If the character succeeds on a DC-12 strength check, the whistle comes free. With the whistle in hand, a character can take an action to blow it, to blow into it, and make a DC-10 wisdom animal handling check. On a success, the owlbear calms and immediately becomes friendly toward the whistle holder and indifferent toward the other characters. That's really cool. You get yourself a pet owlbear. <laughs> However, it won't leave the area. It now considers its territory, and any attempt to force it to leave makes it hostile. All right, well, it's it's neat. So you can calm it down to potentially, you know, get out of the combat situation that you're in, but you can't use it as a, uh, a force of reckoning with your party. That would be, co be cool if you could. But hey, it's your game. Uh, you, can, you can do what you want. If you want to ignore that last bit and say that they can take the owlbear with them, you can always do that. It's D&D &D after all. Cobalt Renegades. This encounter is a different challenge for first level characters and can be excuse me re, that not different but difficult. This encounter is a difficult challenge for first level characters and can be scaled up for second or third level characters as noted below. It's appropriate whenever characters are traveling around the island by land. A group of kobolds tries to ambush the characters. They're hiding in the rocks and light foliage hoping to get the jump on the adventurers. Make a dexterity stealth check for the kobolds, rolling once for all of them and using the dexterity modifier plus two of the wingless kobolds. Compare the result to the character's passive wisdom perception scores. Any character whose score is lower than the kobolds result is surprised and loses their turn during the first round of combat. See surprise in the rulebook. Read this text when the kobolds attack. A yipping sound erupts around you as angry kobolds emerge from their hiding place, uh, from their place of hiding and attack. So let's look at the kobolds and the winged kobolds. All right, kobolds. So we'll start with the kobolds and then we'll look at the winged kobolds. Kobolds are reptilian humanoids that often revere dragons. Physically weak, they find strength in numbers. A, cobalt, a few kobolds are born with leathery wings and can fly, which is often seen as a gift from dragon gods. Okay, armor class of 12, only 5 hit points, or 2d6 minus 2 if you roll your own. Challenge is very low, it's just an 8. And they have a speed of 30, there's their stat block. Alright, pack tactics. The kobold has advantage on an attack roll against a creature if at least one of the kobold's allies is within five feet of the creature and the ally is not incapacitated. Sunlight sensitivity. While in sunlight, the kobold has disadvantage on any attack rolls as well as on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. Actions. Dagger. Melee or ranged weapon attack. Plus four to hit. Uh, the reach is five. Or... A range of 20 out to 60 uh, one target uh, I should say a range of I think that's at least 20 feet and then out to 60 feet uh, one target 
uh, does four damage upon a hit, four piercing damage, or you roll the damage yourself, 1d4 plus two. They have a sling, which is a ranged weapon attack, plus four to hit. The range, I think the way that, if I recall correctly, 30 means they have to be at least 30 feet away. And then the 120 is the as if they're they can't be any more than 120 feet 120 feet away. Uh, one target, uh, four damage, four bludgeoning damage, or roll it yourself 1d4 plus two. And then we have the winged cobalt, slightly better armor class. Uh, a couple more hit points. Uh, same speed, but they can fly. Dark vision, all that's the same. A little bit more of a challenge rating. Same pack tactics. Same sensitivity to light. Uh, the same dagger weapon, but they also have a dropped rock action. Uh, ranged weapon attack, plus five to hit one target directly below the kobold. Uh, six bludgeoning damage if it hits. So they fly up, grab uh, some kind of rock, drop it on you as, there, as, as a one possible attack. Four kobolds and one winged kobold, all lawful evil, participate in this ambush. So four, five, four, so five total. These cruel, vicious kobolds reject both the peaceful teachings of Renara and the tyrannical rule of Sparkrender, and they prey on travelers who stray from the dragon's rest. They haven't had much success and are desperate, so they're hostile and fight to the death. Their desperation means that they can easily be persuaded to stop fighting with an offer of money or food. Otherwise, they're not interested in conversation or negotiation. So if your characters are second level, uh, use six kobolds and two winged kobolds. If they're third level, they suggest you use eight kobolds and three winged kobolds. And I, I tend to find that they overestimate these a bit, so I might scale that down a little. Uh, I felt like the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, I felt like some of those encounters were just ridiculous and you just outright die. What lies beneath? As described in the adventure background section in the introductions, Stormwreck Isle was formed from magic-fueled volcanic activity in the tomb of a monstrous red dragon named Sharuth. Some legends and rumors suggest Sharuth is not actually dead, merely imprisoned beneath the island and the activity in Sea Growl Cave suggests that all is not well beneath Stormwreck Isle. You can devise your own adventures around characters investigating Sharuth's tomb. Characters might scour the island until they find hidden vents they can use to access winding tunnels leading deep into the earth. More fume drakes and fire snakes might lurk below. Perhaps there is even a group of kobolds who, might, who, who serve mighty Sharuth. Such an adventure is yours to devise, and you can put your unique spin on what the characters do and discover there. Of course, if you're not ready to craft an expedition into the caverns beneath the island, then the characters simply don't discover those subterranean passengers, uh, passages, no matter how much they search. So that's interesting. So it gives you, you know, it's a pre-written adventure, but this particular section gives you an idea to uh, generate your own idea, uh, to generate your own adventure. Okay, and uh, that's it for chapter one.